Hi, I'm Nicola. And I'm Julia. And we're the project leaders from YMCA Malta on the My Voice to Europe project. My Voice to Europe is an Erasmus Plus project co-funded by the European Union that is being administered through the European Union Programs Agency. My Voice to Europe has brought together a group of young people to share their thoughts, ideas and research on topics that they deemed important for the Maltese Islands. These young people have developed 13 important themes and produced 13 podcasts with stakeholders, young people and professionals related to the theme. Keep watching and engage with the discussion in the comments. Hello everyone, my name is Dion Vella and uh, I am going to be um, facilitating this uh, podcast for today. Um, how about we start you know, introducing yourselves um, to this conversation? Who would like to start? The same. So I'm Dennis Vella Valdertino. Uh, I'm the commissioner, just to quote the, what, what the law, the title given by law is the commissioner for the promotion of rights of people with mental disorders. In short, commissioner for mental health. That's very interesting. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Dr. Dr. Dennis Vella Valdertino. Thank you very much uh, um, for joining us today. Glad to be here. I am Deborah. Um, I am um, a forensic psychology practitioner by profession. I have graduated recently. I work at Richmond Foundation in one of the services that it offers. Um, the service that I manage is called Kids, Kids in Development. It's a residential program for children and young people who have experienced severe adversity in their early childhood days and as a result of which they develop um, an array of social, behavioral, and emotional issues, and at times, obviously, it affects their, their mental health. And so they reside with us in order to um, be supported in resolving these past traumas, so to speak. That's a very fascinating, fascinating uh, way to work, and congratulations for your graduation. Thank you. Uh, so, so as you may all know, um, the podcast today is about youth and mental health, and I want to start off it. Um, what is your definition of mental health? Yeah. Quite a bit of you know a lot to say about this, not just a definition. So I don't want to go with the textbook case definition of mental health. It's just like physical health. I would rather go to the opposite. Now, talking about mental health is the positive aspect. It's like the glass, which is half full and half empty. But whether define or this, you know, discuss is that mental health is mental well-being. In the absence of that, you go to mental health problems. Now, mental health problems is not the person who's just seeing things or he feels depressed. It's there is something which is not uh, in harmony with society, with the way we feel. So it's a problem is the way we feel, the way we think, it's our emotions, the way we integrate with our college, with our society. So human nature, and I believe Deborah could have collaborate further, no one is there to be on his own. So the way we interact with others, the way we think, the thought process, our emotions, how we feel, okay? All that, if you put it on the positive side, that we are in synchrony with, with let's say, the common, with everyone, that is mental health. It gives, it's, it gives such a, how would you say, a positive aspiration, a positive development. Anyone in good mental health is able to progress further is able to find scope in anything, all right? When that is a problem, then they will become the mental health problems. Uh, yeah, but I don't know if you would like to elaborate from your perspective. There is not much more to it. I think you gave quite a wide explanation of what you understand, of what we understand with mental health. Um, the way I see it is that as human beings, we have our health, right? And that's that is comprised of our physical and mental health. Um, and just like from time to time, we experience certain physical issues. We are sick, we are unwell, we get injured. Similarly, from time to time, we are all prone to experiencing mental health issues. They might not always develop to disorders, but um, tying with what Dr. Dennis was saying, we need to take care of ourselves 
so that we take care of ourselves holistically, both our physical health and mental health. Because as humans, we all we are all prone, and I I, I don't feel that I can stress this enough that as human beings, we are all prone to experiencing mental health difficulties from time to time. I agree. Jeez. Sorry, yeah, you're mentioning you're mentioning human beings. As, as you were talking, I was thinking even animals have their own perspective. You know the way they feel, yes. the way they interact. So it's not yes. to be, you know, it, it's it's nature. Yes, I agree a lot with your points. Um, and it is, it's it's a way it's a way of life. It's so it's human nature. And I really liked the point that you made, Dr. Um, Dennis, and that we are not meant to live on our own. We are we are social beings. We we grow through connection. Um, you've mentioned as well that <laughs> you know mental health is also uh, what is related to mental health is also um, uh, mental illness or mental issues. And I wanted to kind of touch a bit more about that, especially when it comes to those challenges and stresses that contribute to those mental health issues. So I wanted to know, like, what, in your opinion, are the specific challenges or stressors that are mostly unique to today's youth and that impact a lot their mental well-being? Um, should I start, Deb, or you would like? To yes, start? go ahead. Go ahead. This is a very interesting question. Thanks, uh, Leon, for, for, for raising it up. And once I was uh, talking to someone, I'm not going to mention by name, and we said, we have to stop thinking about that romantic nostalgia of the past. But if you were to look, the past gives us some information and what we may not, we may be missing right now or we are not aware. So let's look into the past. You can go into prehistory, okay? where people just live because there was sunlight. And then everything stops. It was primitive, no, no medical care, no, they had to fight for survival. They depended on the crop, they, they were growing on the animals that they had. And it was a typical life, but it was maybe prehistoric. Let's, let's, let's put it aside, that's prehistoric. Let's look at our recent part, okay? where things were not as advanced as today. We're talking advanced, now we have to define advanced. But the problem is, there was a particular lifestyle. People hard working, suffering, a lot of, I would say, poverty, um, but we were a little bit, uh, with an inverted comma, simple. So again, the day seemed to finish as soon as the sun went down. Now, I'm not a religious person to, to, to you know these things, but there was the bell toll that, you know, the, it's time to stop and, and whatever. What happened then? So people used to sit down either at the church harvest or somewhere and it just enjoy or rest after they, they, their day's work. Drinking wine, talking, chatting, smoking, cigars or whatever. That's men, even females. They used to sit on the on the on the doorstep, getting chairs, stools, and again talking. So this was the kind of debris. I think Sidebra is quite into the subject. But it had there was no television, there was no mobile, there was no part-time jobs, set jobs, and but this and we look back and say, but that's the past. That's romantic. This is what the word I, I, I was told. Let's not think about it. But then let's go to the day. I think the, the day is still 24 hours, but we make it 36 hours, 24.5 hours, 26 hours. We want to make 26 hours in a day, which is 24 hours. And this is what the stressors that you mentioned. So it starts from childhood, youth, adulthood, and the elderly. All right? So it seems we don't have time for anything. When I'm talking, I would even point the finger at myself. So. If we start at school, we go to school, an early rise, come on, it's still dark and you have to get your transport to get to school on time. And then you stay, you know, a one hour traveling, sleeping on the minivan, just to arrive um, to your school. All right? School is school. I think the system is still based on academic achievements. So 
if someone is into getting their high grades, you have to finish school, can go for private lessons, you know, it's all the private lessons, rushing and homeworks and, and whatever. But this is what's causing stress in childhood. How much time are they dedicating to flex, to, 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 to do that other things, which are not <laughs> All right? But that's childhood. Let's go into our adulthood. Now, we know the issues related to cost of living, all right? And to try and man, uh, make ends meet, you take one job, overtime, possibly second job, possibly a job within a job, all right? And then I arrive at night, as soon as we arrive home, tired, exhausted, mobiles, emails again, and this is the concept of the European Union, the right to disconnect, okay? We don't have time to talk. We don't have time to stop. Lucky are those who manage their time and, and go for sports and for, for, for whatever, all right? Um, um, but then go place of work. Output oriented, you're not performing well, you've got deadlines, you have to take another task, otherwise you're on the blacklist of whoever is your superior. So all these are distresses. And then in the evening, oh no, I need to go out. I mean, we're meeting friends, we're going to spend the night out, drinking, smoking, whatever we're doing. But then tomorrow at six o'clock you have to be at work or seven o'clock you have to be at work. So we take it for granted. You drive. Oh my God, I do, it. I do this myself. You have to pray and make sure that you arrive on time, holding horns, you know, from one um, road you go to the other. It's the road rage. It's the stress at the place of work. So all these are the stressors that we are passing every day. We take them for granted. We go to a restaurant. And again, we open up our mobile. We use the bathroom and again, we use our mobile. We eat and we use our mobile. This is life again today. Now we take them for granted. So that's why I started prehistoric, our recent past, and today. This is development. This is modern work. If you don't, if you if you're not there, you're not up to date with situation. So you drive, you have your ear pieces handsy, and you still talk and hear. You drive, this is not just mode, okay? Long distances, and you listen to podcasts and whatever. We can't <laughs> All right, so we're running after time when time is dead. 24 hours yes yes and it's like yes yeah as you said we keep running trying to meet the demands of life and we start to forget forget not that we're willing to forget but we end up forgetting you know what is in front of us what is um what is uh what is around us the connections that we have um I would like to hear, and uh, very actually, mind you, um, very good point you've made, Dr. Dennis. It was it was a really lovely answer to that question. I'd like to also hear um Deborah's opinion about this. I think the thing that um suffers the most when we think of all this are our relationships. At the end of our day, um, all of us probably go back home feeling super tired because of the reasons that Dr. Dennis has just mentioned. And as a result, we don't have the energy to connect, to communicate, to, to, to be with our loved ones. And I think this is something that unfortunately happens in most of the households, right? Not just in Malta, even abroad. So our children, the messages that we are giving to our children is... We've come back home after a long day's work. We are tired. The children are probably tired as well because I remember being in a conference not so long ago and we were discussing how young children are being sent to the to the breakfast clubs and the after school program um, from early morning till, till late afternoon, evening. And mind you, God forbid there weren't these services because the cost of living doesn't allow us not to work. So as, as of yet, I don't have my, my own children, but I can't see myself stopping working when I do have my children. So I know that in a couple of years time, I will probably be caught up in this cycle myself. Um, but as we're saying, we, co we come back home, everyone is tired. We will probably encourage our children to do something that allows us to rest a little bit. So probably we'll give them our tablets, we will, we will, we will put them in front of the TV so that they can stay quiet and, and, and contained. And so we are not spending time together. So all of the things that we are mentioning are quite concerning, but the thing that concerns me the most 
is how much our relationships are, are currently suffering. And social media, I always like to add the point of social media when we're mentioning this, because social media tends to give us the impression that we are very well connected. If I had to go on Facebook, if I had to go on, on my Instagram or, on, or my other profiles, I will have a, a long list of friends, right? But that doesn't mean I am I have healthy connections with them. If, if I had to think of, of, of the people that are closest to me, are very very few the, the, the quality the, the the quality of the relationships. So sometimes, um, and this ties to loneliness. Sometimes it's not about how many people you know or how many people you're surrounded by, but the quality of the relationships that you have at the end of the day. And because of the fast-paced life that we are living, we are not having, we are not being left with enough um, time to invest well in our in relationships. That is what concerns me the most. And I really believe that this does contribute a lot to mental health challenges. Uh, Deborah, you mentioned as well um, something about um, something about the parents as well. Even for example, parents go through the same thing that the children go. They always have something to do. Always doesn't have. Mm -hmm. to time to connect very well um, and I wanted to ask like for both of you like in the case for parents and educators how do you believe that they can best support um the youth their children young people um who are struggling with these mental health challenges do you want to start your sentence then <laughs> okay good I, I, zoom zoom tends to confuse me because I wouldn't want to jump on someone else so I always wait for someone to give me the go ahead um so Supporting our children and youth, I think we need to move um towards helping our children, helping our young people, future adults to become resilient. Because at the end of the day, we can't eradicate the, the challenges that we're facing. We can try to work around them. But at the end of the day, as we're saying, none of us can stop working. None of us can um do much different than what we're doing. But um, I think we need to instill in our in our children, first of all, a good sense of time management. And I believe that as, as adults, we have the responsibility to uh, model, role model, a good sense of time management. So let's find time to be together. And in that time that we are together, what are we going to do? Because we can still be together and stay, stay on our phones, right? If, if you go to restaurants nowadays, you will see whole families all on their phones and their tablets and not communicating. So I think we can, first of all, is to model this sense of how to build relationships and how to communicate and how to be with feelings. So when we're talking with children, it is very important that uh, we don't dismiss their feelings, even though possibly the issues that they might present to us for us adults, they might not seem very, very drastic but for the child it might be quite quite big it might be quite quite meaningful so we need to support our children to identify be with their with their feelings communicate well and also um time management because because at the end of the day all of us there are lots of demands placed placed on all of us so if we, if we had to talk, think about children Children have to go to school, have to perform well, have to do well in exams. We always expect them to be better. We always tell, we always tell them to go to do well in exams because otherwise they will not have a, have, a, have a successful job in the future. So I think we need to pace ourselves a little bit to go with the flow of the child, each and every specific child, because not each child will have its own, its own, its own needs and difficulties and teach them at the end of the day how to be resilient, how to bounce back in face of the challenges that life will inevitably throw at them. Thank you very much, Deborah. I do agree a lot on the time management. Well said, Deborah. Um, the question, Leon, you mentioned uh, educators and parents. First and foremost, we have to decide. Are these, are, let's call them entities. I don't want to call them entities, but let's call them are these separate entities or are they, are they a continuum? Is there a link between them or not? So if educators believe, and I'm not an educator myself by profession, but if educators that their role is just teaching and it stops there, I think we have a problem. If we're on the other hand, we're going to think that educators are parents, I think that's another problem. 
but this is a kind of a shared ownership. I, the way I see it is this is a kind of a shared ownership, a continuum. We trust our children in the, to spend a good number of hours with our educators who are well-trained, who are professional people, and it's not just in arithmetic or the languages or in physics or chemistry or whatever, but in everything. You are seeing a child the day after day, from young age to adult, to getting to an adolescent, developing. So the educator has a good understanding of the development. And uh, when we started the definition, you have to be at par, you have to be in synchrony with others. Mm -hmm. So anyone who falls at the end, there could be problems. So the educator is the one who's noticing, who's, who's there to support, who's there to understand how the interactions with the other students, because we mentioned the social interaction as well, how the interactions, how the innovation, how the way we are thinking, they are picking up all these things. Now, if the educator doesn't communicate with the parent, all that information is just being put there and it stops there. So there is an important integration between the parents and the educators. I'm not aware if this is strong right now. I don't know if it was strong before and now it's stronger or weaker. Uh, you know, in the past there were the Parent Teachers Association. Now it's not just to organize the bingos or the parties or whatever. It is the chance, the, the time to literally get each other, it, it, to be, like we call them entities, to discuss development of our children. So for me, that interaction is very positive. And this communication between parents and, <clears throat> and, and educators should be strong. Okay? Just as for when a child moves from one school to another, there should be uh, an adequate transfer of this psychological development, of this uh, development of the child, whether academically, whether in, in, in innovation, whether in interaction, it has to, if it falls, if it stops, I think we're letting the system down. We're, we're, the, the system is failing. So the link between uh, educators and parents is, 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 is intimate. Now, Deborah mentioned, and, that, and again, it was, it was shown in a study carried out by, uh, by, by the group of the social, uh, of the President Foundation. Children are missing on interaction with their parents, communication time. It's not just, and Deborah mentioned it, it's not just you are there, you give them a gadget, you give them uh, an iPad to play, or, or, or it's how much we stop and listen to them. And this is not just in childhood or in adulthood. It has to be something which is true. Children, and they are missing it. It's proven on this study that was presented. Children are missing on this. Mm -hmm. We don't have time. We are too busy. We are tired. Okay? So we need to keep this interaction between parents. It's already that there are not enough problems in society. All right? And our children should be there. Um, Deborah mentioned oh, even the opportunities. Let's not forget anyone in our social strata. So if we think that us, because we are educated, because we are, uh, we, are, we are university graduates and whatever, it's not us. Get to the grassroots of society. Yes. Are they also on the same frequency or we're just letting them aside? So this message, this message of, of interacting, listening, communication has to reach the grassroots. And that is difficult. Yes, I love if, if I can add um, a point to what Dr. Dennis was saying, um, I am biased in this sense because I have always worked with children in care, right? So I tend to be a little bit biased, but I feel that this is I need to advocate for children who do not have the privilege of having a family, a safe base to go home to at the end of the day. So when we think of children and young people, most of the time, we tend to think of those children who wake up in the morning, catch their transport or, or, or are taken to school by their, by their parents and then join their family at the end of each day. Unfortunately, this is not the situation for a portion of children in, in Malta and obviously around the world. So when we think of children, it is also very important to keep in mind that there are a number of children who, because of a different number of reasons, unfortunately, go home 
at the end of the day, after all the stress that the day would have presented in itself, to abuse, to neglect, to a lack of, of safety, or else um, they might not return back home with their families, but return back to their care home. So obviously this is something that I wanted to add because um, Dennis mentioned that we need to make sure that everyone is given an equal opportunity and something that, that, that pains me at times is that these children are often put to the sidelines because thankfully they are not in the majority, um, but they are still there. So even if there is just one child who is experiencing something of the sort, we need to make sure that that child is given the same opportunity just as each and every other child or young person that there is out there. Yes. I love how you, uh, Deborah, I love how you've spoken a lot on the parent side. And Dr. Dennis spoke a lot on the educator side, apart from making the link between them. And I do believe that, uh, unfortunately, we don't communicate, oh, as, a, as a whole, there is a lack of communication towards the children and the youth. Uh, um, uh, mainly because, of course, the public have little knowledge, uh, little knowledge on mental health, especially among youth, um, and also it has a lot of stigma to it with the youth. And I'm curious to know um, how we can reduce the stigma that surrounds the health in schools and also in Maltese communities. Yeah, do we start or we start? You can start, go for it. I love the subject. Stigma. How can we remove stigma? The word stigma from our dictionaries. Is it possible? To remove it altogether, I don't believe it's possible, but reducing it is a possibility. But let's start by removing the word stigma from our dictionaries. That's difficult. Now, the thing is this. If we are going to talk about mental health issues as a disease, as a contagious condition, then stigma exists. But the problem is, if we are talking not about mental health problems, this is my nomenclature, uh, Commissioner for the Promotion of Rights of People Mental Disorders, that's the law, okay? Let's, call it, let, let's remove the word disorders, mental health issues. And who doesn't have a mental health issue? The Pope, the Prime Minister, Donald Trump, who? Everyone. At a moment in time, will pass through a negative. Life is not planar. Life is ups and downs. This is normal. All right? Today I feel fine, beautiful. It might be that tomorrow or next week, I would feel lousy, tired, exhausted. Things are getting all, you know, uh, all black. So, um, if we are going to instill, I'm going to uh, instill, bring up our children, bring up our adolescents, <laughs> Bring up our youth. Um, it was a motto, I think, of two years ago. It's okay not to be okay. So, if we are going to add, um, a change our education system, our format, that is not just the academic achievement. As soon as you go out from that school door uh, of your school, of your college, you're going to face problems. I mentioned traffic, then the family, then the community, then cyberbullying. So life is problems. All right? So we need to prepare our young children, our future generations. Don't, don't forget that could be my age. All right? So life is full of problems. We have to build their resilience, Deborah mentioned, how to deal. So instead of closing uh, into oneself, and I feel odd. Why is it that my friends are grouping together and I'm left out? Is it because I don't have hair enough or whatever? All right? So we need to build. It's okay not to be okay. And if you have a problem, you can knock at someone's door, not at the black door or in the corner or you flag it that this is the one with a problem. So in our schools, in our colleges, and I'm sure that, for example, MCAS, University of Malta, they have set up their own support systems, okay? It's not as if you're going to, you know, the, in the Bible, the, the, the lepers used to be thrown out uh, outside the city in a cave and ring the bell if you're coming and don't touch and hide yourself. So 
we need to actively, actively, and this is the role of psychologists, of counselors, of our educators, that we need to teach what we call mental health first aid, life skills, all right? So by, by instilling, by changing mentality, that it's okay to be not to be okay, that you might feel down, tomorrow you have pressures, you have problems, how are you going to address it? This is what, but how you can remove that word stigma. So if someone ends up requiring to need to go to a psychiatrist, it's not the end of the world. You are going to a psychiatrist, to a psychologist, to a counselor, because it's part of a normal process. It's like when we go for any checkup, all right, for our gynae checkup, for our hypertension checkup, for our diabetes, for anything, all right? It has to be, and it's not just at school, but even in our sports communities, we have to build this, this, this understanding. Yes, in fact, um, in the beginning, that is why I started by alluding to the physical health, um, because I feel that why, once we equate physical health and mental health together, it makes it more acceptable for a person to understand and recognize that they may um, require the, the intervention of a psychiatrist, of a psychologist, just like we sometimes need to go to GPs. Something as part of my job from time to time, I go and deliver talks to students and something that I always enjoy doing during these talks is I uh, I put up um, in my presentation, I put up photos of celebrities who are who have been um, opened up, have opened up about their um, psychological uh, Sorry, psychological issues and mental health disorders. And the first thing I ask them is, who are these people? And most of them, they would obviously know who these people are. And then I ask them, what do these people have in common? And then they all say, oh, they're, they're successful. And I say, yes, they're successful. That, that one is in that movie. That one is, is a singer of that song, whatever. And then I tell them, but they have something else in common. They all suffer from mental health difficulties or have suffered from mental health difficulties. But in spite of that difficulty, in spite of that condition, that did not stop them from achieving whatever they would have achieved. And this is something that always leaves everyone in awe, especially young people in awe. And I am very glad that, that Dr. Dennis mentioned first aid because um, most of us are trained in physical first aid, especially people who work with, with people um, are trained to what to do and how to intervene if someone um, has an accident or, or is feeling unwell. Richmond Foundation also offers um, mental health first aid. And when we offer the courses that we offer are not only, apart from the standard one that, that covers the standard mental health first aid, it also offers um, the youth mental health first aid so that people working with, with, with young people, essentially, and adolescents can feel supported enough to help these, these the children, the, their clients, their students, whenever and if ever they, they face any issues. And on top of that, we also offer the teen mental health first aid course, whereby we also um, teach uh, the students, the, the students themselves, the teens themselves, um, how to recognize certain issues, how to intervene if needs be, um, and, and what um, support the person might, might need. Before, when we mentioned educators, um, something came to mind. Recently, I have been meeting different people who work in schools in different capacities, and most of them tell you most of the, the problems that we're that we're meeting recently seem to be on the rise. Everyone seems to have some some sort of problems. The students come up to us with a lot and a lot of baggage, with a lot and a lot of issues. And I think it is very important that we support our educators at the end of the day, because I don't think it would be fair either on the child or on the student, because if they need help, they deserve the help that, that they, they need. But we can't expect the, the educators to do something that they are not trained in. I am not trained in, in medicine, so you can't expect me to prescribe something or give advice on something that I am not trained in right and i don't think it would be fair that we put our educators in that position either so we need to make sure that our educators for their sake and for the sake of our children and future adolescents and adults are well trained well feel well supported so as to be able to guide this the student um through the right channel at the end of the day yes um, and there are some few points that I, I had in mind that I want to I want to touch on when you spoke. Uh, um, I'm 
I work in I work in a residential residential setting um with the government and uh, as most uh most of the time the ones who are working in in care are subjected to training in mental health first aid. I'm aware that Richmond Richmond um facilitates such training. And also when you talk, when talked about, you know, people who are having physical issues or also had mental issues, what I wanted to bring up is that I'm also a trainee Gestalt psychotherapist. And in my study, in my studies along the course, I I was made aware that what is experienced in the mind is also felt in the body, and they have a connection between the mind and the body. Mm -hmm. Um when you're talking about um these uh, um these mental health first state trainings um uh, to kind of increase increase the awareness and also help the educators i feel this also has to touch a lot on um policy making i wanted to ask like what do you believe um how uh, what do you believe the topic of mental health um is, how is it relevant to policy makers Good day, Dr. Dennis. That's a very sensitive subject, which I love. I've been in office since two years. And my role is clearly defined in the Mental Health Act. The thing is, I believe I'm taking up, well, I don't want to be uh, a Zadat, what we call a Zadat. So it's mental health problems are on the increase. The data is showing us that. So unless, and, and whoever wants to see it, just look at the number of people in more chronic mental health problems, mental health diseases, who are accessing the pharmacy of your choice to take regular medications. So unless these people are taking these medications for fun or to as vitamins, which is not the case, okay? Those numbers are on the increase. None of the chronic diseases are plateauing or going down. Now, people who want to analyze might say, yes, because the population is on decrease. It's because there is more awareness. It's because more people are getting their medications free of charge. But now we are talking about only the medications which people are getting free of charge. They are not talking about people who buy the medication privately. Why am I mentioning this? So if we're seeing that the number of people who are requiring medical because it's not just medicine, but who are requiring medical intervention are on the increase. For me, and it's not today, and it's not just Malta, it's globally. This is another, and let's, let's go for the buzzword, another pandemic. The pandemic didn't happen just out of the blues. We knew that the pandemic could hit us sometime from the past history. So we are seeing a global increase in mental health problem. There is more awareness, and that is something which is positive. All right? So the thing is, you mentioned policymakers. So mental health cannot remain a health issue, just a health issue. We may touch so many things, society. We mentioned traffic. We mentioned building. We mentioned the education system. All right? We're talking about communities. So everyone has a role to play to prevent mental health problems and prevention means that there is early intervention early support no one you can't say that mental health problem equals a, a psychiatric problem it's a bigger spectrum which is before all right people who are women people who are alone people who are bullied at the place of work at schools uh, on, on the internet all right it's all deep inside it's each individual is studying this problem in his on his own or her own. All right. Now we need to get these people to vent out and seek support. Yes. So you mentioned policymakers. If the policymaker is not aware, oh well, not aware, he hasn't opened his or her eyes, okay, to understand that we are touching these problems. Now, whether it is substance abuse, whether it is criminality, whether it is uh, absenteeism from schools, whether it is I don't know what else to say. These are all, it's not, it's not the Ministry for Health. This is a whole of government approach. So you mentioned policymakers. Policymakers, please. This is my role as a commissioner. I will be presenting my annual report and I'm just changing this um, emphasis. I don't want to talk about Mount Carmel Hospital. I want to talk about the mental health issues that unless action is carried out 
across the whole of Gaza. So this is not politics, okay? Education, local councils, church authorities, at the places of work, at home, elderly, unless we, the problems are on the increase. Now, when mental health problems are on the increase, that means that the economy will start faltering because of sick leave, because of lack of uh, loss of initiatives, because of family break breakups. Okay, so all this, this is why uh, the policymaker has a major, the biggest role to do, not just the health ministry, but across the board. This is about increasing the quality of life for everyone. Yeah. What is your opinion about this, Deborah? Well, um, there is not much more to add um, other than what, what Dr. Dennis said. I think that it is very important to look at this systemically, as we're saying. So I don't think we can pinpoint fingers and say, listen, listen, this is what is not working or, or that is what is not working. We need to come together as a nation and come up with solutions together. Because um, something that I always feel that... I always experience this sense of a bit of a rabbit hole in a sense, whereby um, people with mental health difficulties, with mental health conditions, with psychiatric problems, tend to be um, marginalized. So in spite of us having come forward and making leaps and bounds to a certain extent when compared to, to, to a couple of decades ago, I still think we are quite behind. So I, I believe that because of this marginalization and then the stigma um, continues to be um, perpetuated, right? And so in spite of noticing that mental health issues are on the increase, I still feel that there are a lot of people who are suffering silently and we are not aware of because for one reason or another, they have not yet um, come forward, have not, have not yet spoken to someone and seek essentially the support and help they need and so this might and then result in other complexities such as further relationship breakdowns further unemployment possible criminal behavior so i think that we need to take it a step back sit down look at what we're doing and see how we can rope in people with mental health difficulties with us when we're taking decisions and ultimately keep the person, the patient, the client, whatever you may wish to call him, at the center of the decisions that are being made. Yes. Teamwork uh, gets the dream work, as they say. <laughs> I'm aware a bit of the time and we have 15 minutes left um, for the podcast. Uh, um, so I'm, I have just a few, few things to um, discuss with you before we can get to a close. Is that okay for you? So yes. much to say. Um, uh, I'm aware that also Malta is not just aware of mental of certain mental health policies, but also mental mental health is also uh, uh, is a huge topic in other European countries. Um, so what do you believe? How can Malta learn from some experiences of European countries when it comes to these mental health practices, especially for youth? Go ahead, Doctor Dennis. Um, looking at good practices helps us, all right? Um, our problems might be unique to our nature, to our territory. But the thing is, if it is uh, global warming, if it is the current war in Ukraine, if it is the current uh, war in Gaza, you feel so much disheartened and the free, all right? Um, job opportunities in Malta. So we have to make sure that as a European Union, okay, we are all singing from the same hymn book because the problems that we are facing, it's not just me, Dennis, in Malta, but it would be Peter in France or, or I don't know where, with their own problems because they will not be to accept the same problems. But we can't think we can find commonalities. So there are good, good practices in Scandinavian countries with uh, with, with uh, evidence evidence proven. Let's look at the good practices in these countries. Let's share them. 
if some countries are not performing well, alcohol-related problems, UK post-Brexit, so it's not just us. So let's learn the good practices and let's see where things are not working. And together at EU level, we need to cascade down because we cannot interfere in each member state, but pass on these good practices. Something which kills me is the time for talking is over. So you mentioned before Deborah mentioned that we have to sit down and see, yes, we should have done it 10 years ago. And today we are implementing things so that we are correcting things and see our effort that they are getting good results. Mm -hmm. So at EU level, yes, mental health is also featuring high on the agenda. We need to learn the good practices, see where things are not performing well, and learn from each other. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Dennis. Well, what is your opinion about this, Deborah? Yes, um, I agree with what Dr. Dennis said in the sense that uh, ideally these conversations were done um, more than unfortunately always, in, in, especially in the mental health field, because this is what, what I have experienced and I, I don't know in other sectors, but it always seems to be a little bit behind in certain decisions and certain um, initiatives or, or, or things that are implemented essentially. Um, sorry, you froze for a sec. I'm not sure whether you lost me. Um, can you can you still hear me? Okay, good. Um, so as I was saying, uh -huh, ideally this was this was done in the past, but I tend to be a bit of a of a hopeful romantic to a certain extent, and and I'd like to believe that it is not too late. Um, I always like um when I'm talking about the subject, the subject it's quite close to heart because as a child, as a young person myself, when I was an adult, an adolescent. I experienced mental health difficulties and I remember talking about 15, 20 years ago, the, the support, the understanding that was back then um, was horrible compared to what we have today. So yes, we have a long way to go and we have a long way ahead of us. But I think we still need to recognize that there have been certain collectively, let's say collectively, we have managed to, um, to come together and at least put mental health on 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 the agenda because 20 years ago 15 years ago it wasn't i remember i used to suffer um, from anxiety as a child and i never used to feel supported or helped whenever i used to try and verbalize my feelings thankfully i had my parents who were very understanding but i remember people outside of the household were were quite dismissive and i remember people telling me why are you crying why are you worrying you you have everything you have your parents and that used to frustrate me quite a lot and it drove me to i remember feeling feeling anxious and telling people that i'm getting an asthma attack because that would get me the attention that i would have needed um whereas telling people that i'm feeling unwell without having the the, the the vocabulary to say what i was feeling um would not get me the same attention so if i had to look at those practices back then i am not pinpointing because obviously i know that there were limitations but to the practices that we offer our youth and children nowadays I, I I feel that uh, we've 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 come a long way, but uh, the longer the, the road is long, and we need to 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 pull up our sleeves and continue working towards ultimately putting um, mental health at the forefront of of our practices at the end of the day. Yes, yes, um, uh, I believe that these are very valid points, and um you've mentioned a lot of points throughout the conversation um for being more connected with the quality of the relationships rather than the quantity and um, seeing what is working and seeing what is not working and trying to you know adjust according to what it, to what is working and build more on it and i think these are really good suggestions that we could make we could propose for a change um in you in your opinions what do you believe are other good suggestions which you believe could be beneficial for change um, okay, so as I mentioned, all these are multifactorial. It's not one ministry, it's not one partner, it's not one stakeholder. So it's a whole of society approach, it's a whole of government approach. So let's look into our community, let's go to our granularity, because we talked about education. So unless the education system is going to review and think about 
their current status, I think we are still remaining the same problems. But let's look into the community. I think the local councils, this is what we're talking about Malta, have a very valid role to play. Are, we, are, are our youth, our younger generations, still actively participating in community work? Or rather, we're too individualistic, we don't have time. There might be some uh, places that still attract youth to participate, to give something back to society. I think we're missing a lot from that because of time restraints, because of other priorities in our life. So instead of just uh, local council having a role to arrange the streets and whatever, let's try to organize more community-related work where we think about communities building together, sharing ideas, uh, and arguing together as well. All right? And this is, I mentioned local councils. It could be the church authorities. So these are the institutions where people get together. When we started the talk, we said the people used to uh, meet in the village square and talk, maybe gossip, all right? So we need people to be inclusive, to share their views, their experience, to involve themselves, make sure that they, their, their, their opinion is well taken up as well. Yes. Um, think about building, uh, the way we build our building. Are, is, are there still open spaces, safe open spaces for our young children, for our youth, to enjoy, relax, have a relaxing time. So all this needs to be actively logged into. Yes, thank you very much for the point. Uh, inclusivity is also important in change. Uh, is to what I wanted to add. Um, obviously, we can go on for ages talking about the topic, um, but something that... <clears throat> repeatedly came up in our conversation was the need to feel connected, the need to have um, relationships, on and so forth. And before I touched upon relationships within the family unit, um, but as Dr. Sen Dr. Dennis mentioned, we need to think about the communities at large. I mean, nowadays, we, we hear a lot of people who might not know who their neighbor is, whereas in the past, you'd know who your neighbor is and you'd have some form of relationship with your neighbor. And at least you'd have the the the, the, the knowledge that if you need, uh, I don't know, a, 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 some milk, you can go knock on the door and the neighbor will help you and then you will help them. There was this sort of reciprocal, um, altruistic relationship. Um, nowadays, that is missing. So I think that the community, the, the, the councils need to, see how they can gel the communities better together, especially in an age where we are living with a lot of foreigners. So it is very easy to feel that, to, to create this divide between us and them and not having the opportunity and the space to get to know them. And most mm -hmm. of the time, people tend to have this sense of apprehension towards for foreigners. And that might not necessarily mean that they are racist. I believe that most of the people who are fearful or apprehensive of foreigners are essentially scared. And they are scared because they would not have had the time to get to know the person, to get to know that that person coming from whichever country he may be coming from is not much different than you or I. So we need to have opportunities to sit down. Um, and given that we are surrounded by so many foreigners, um, try and work on integrating um, on integration better. And that would help ultimately the connection, the relationships, and hopefully mental health as well. All it takes is a little conversation. Well, not not a little conversation because because I, I know that it, it requires work. So so I I I don't expect um people to hear our conversation and say, ah, so this is what that, that this is what needs to be done. Things things take time. But I think we need to identify sort of what may help us, what may support us in um ultimately becoming um better neighbors, better, better wives, better husbands, better parents, better colleagues, and 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 better human beings at the end of the day, because that's what we want, the, the, the holistic well-being of ourselves and ultimately of our communities. Yes, yes, I agree with your point. Um, we have two minutes left um, to the podcast. And to wrap up, I want to ask you if, if you could have a message 
um, a short message that you'd like to pass on to, to the youth, what would it be? Short message. First we start, it's okay not to be okay. I like those buzzwords. Two, if you feel something awkward, strange, not up to uh, expectations, you need to seek support. Let's not talk about psychiatrist or Mount Carmen because those are the taboos. Think about uh, tra getting training, as Deborah mentioned, mental health first aid. You need to talk with your friends, okay? As long as they are positive and supportive, knock at the door of counselors, knock at the door of whoever can provide and they are trained to provide support. All right, so please do not close up and remain, it's my problem. And if I talk, I'm an outcast. Thank you very much, Dr. Dennis. So Deborah, what uh, would be your message to the youth? Where Dr. Dennis left off, um, similarly, I would like to encourage any person, any young person, adolescent who is currently struggling um, to reach out. Help is available, support is available. Um, Richmond Foundation has its helpline 1770 and has its Oli chat, um, whereby since since uh, nowadays we tend to text more, maybe a person would feel would feel more comfortable to to, to speak over over texting. Um, these are open during office hours, and then there's the national um, helpline one five seven nine, um, where the person can go and seek support. There are several other other platforms, kelimne dot com one seven nine, um, so on and so forth. So help is out there. Don't um hold back. And something that I would also like to add is enjoy your youth. I remember when I was a young adult, a youth, an adolescent myself, I had this um, urge to grow up and 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 start having. I I couldn't wait to get my first job. I couldn't wait to 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 turn eighteen so that I can go to certain to, to certain places and be recognized as an adult. However, once you turn eighteen. You will no longer be a youth again. You will forever be 18 and you add on to that, but you will not get the chance to be a child and a young person again. So enjoy your youth. Don't try to grow up too quickly. Enjoy being a young person and you deserve the right to be a young person without assuming certain responsibilities that aren't yours. Let adults um, take care of you be responsible in your own right for where you should be responsible, but enjoy your youth. Thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you very much, Dr. Dennis. You've been an excellent pair of participants for this pod pod podcast. <laughs> um, so I want to wish you, I wish you very well in your journeys and in your continuous journeys, especially you, Deborah, since you since you just graduated. Um, uh, and also you, Dr. Dennis, in your in your work towards mental health. Um, have a good, have a, a good, enjoy your lives. Take care, and uh, and again, thank you very much for participating. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, and well done. Thank you for watching our podcast. We hope you found it fruitful. So, what are we going to do with these podcasts? On the 11th of May at the Valletta Design Cluster, our young people will be sharing the results of these podcasts and the research around the project to our guests, which will include MEPs and MEP candidates of the upcoming election. Join us on the 11th of May at the Valletta Design Cluster by registering through the link on this post or by contacting us on info at ymcainwalta.org. See you there.